What were they like to fly the T-37s? Yeah, I'm coming to that. <laughs> uh, to start with, I got a very nice instructor. I thought a gentleman who was from the Royal Air Force, uh, instructor at the Central Frank School, mm -hmm. uh, Flight Lieutenant uh, Peter Glover. Uh, he was a master, really, although a seven theory uh, pilot, but he was a master at uh, teaching. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in his hands, I, well, I was the first one to get a solo on the T-37, uh, I think seven hours or something. Uh, that was early. Uh, very nice aircraft, uh, more like a sports car. It was low. You just, you know, stepped uh, one step in, in the cockpit, mm -hmm. side by side seating. Uh, very nice layout. Uh, there were no problems. In fact, half the problems on a single seat aircraft are with the guy sitting on your right side. <laughs> so he was a thorough gentleman, very gentle person, very nice mm -hmm. to talk to. Uh, he just forgive mistakes, no problem at all. <laughs> so got excellent guidance from him, and I did my uh, solo in aerobatics, basic aerobatics and instrument flying. And that was about the time when he had to leave. His tenure was up, and he had to go back to the Royal Air Force. And I was taken over by a number of instructors then, an expert in formation flying uh, taught me formation aerobatics, uh, formation uh, flying, and then uh, navigation and night flying and so on. I got three different instructors for each of the phases, so I didn't have a particular instructor. And finally, uh, with about uh, 170 or 180 hours, we graduated. Uh, you could sort of misbehave with it. It was a centrifugal compressor. And I'll tell you what I did on my solo, and you get an idea of what uh, the aircraft was like. Mm -hmm. uh, on the first solo, uh, we had to manually lower a lever on the left side gradually. And you'd be allowing fuel by doing that. Mm -hmm. Uh, the automatic fuel metering didn't come in yet till the engine had started. So uh, we were manually supposed to sort of keep lowering it. And uh, the exhaust cat, uh, the EGT gauge would only show up when combustion had taken place. And the only way of finding out that combustion had taken place was that the crew chief, he had his head in the exhaust and he would be looking for a flame. Wow. <laughs> the moment he saw it, he'd just uh, shake the rudder, which was right on top of him. Really? Now, here, uh, there were dozens of aircraft uh, starting up at the same time, so I don't know whether my aircraft had started up or not with the canopy closed. And I thought uh, there had been no rudder flick, uh, you know, signaling combustion. So I continued to lower the lever, adding more and more fuel. The combustion had taken place. I was supposed to stop, and I just kept lowering it, and the engine had actually started. And I couldn't sort of figure out because... Uh, there were no vibrations, a very smooth engine, and there was a lot of noise anyway with the other aircraft mm -hmm. around. So next I see somebody just running and uh, give me a cutthroat signal. So I couldn't figure out what had happened. I looked at my EGT gauge and it was still at zero. Actually, it had gone round and 900 degrees was next to zero. So it had gone 900 <laughs> degrees. Anyway. I burned the engine. Really. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And I thought I was done with my flying because they'd warned me or something or maybe take me off flying. But they didn't. Just a verbal warning. Yeah, be careful. Don't burn an engine again. <laughs> <laughs>